Hey everyone, it's Rachel. I quit my job to day trade for a year and this is the story of how it went. I went in with a focus on building a trading bot that trades US stocks. I tried out manually trading and I also ended up expanding a little bit into options as well. Obviously I had no real idea how this was going to go, but I decided to treat it like a business from the start and just see what I could do. I haven't explained to any of my friends what it is that I actually do or did. And so everyone has these like totally bizarre perceptions of what it is that I do. There's like eight different categories they put me into and they're all completely off base. So I figured now's probably a good time to clarify before things get any further. Some people think I'm bathing in money. Some people think I'm gambling away my life savings, pumping crypto scams, losing all my money on hype stocks, whatever. None of it's true. So here's the actual truth. This is a high level overview of the journey I took, but it's not a tutorial and it's not a peek into my bank account. So forget about those, but if you are still interested in just learning what I learned, then grab a snack and let's jump into it. So just to give some context, I'm gonna start from when I was working full time before I started any of this. So I was working full time as a software engineer at a pretty large company and I was getting paid a little bit in cash and a little bit in stocks. And all I knew about stocks was that the stock portion of my compensation fluctuated like crazy for seemingly no reason, and I wanted to learn how to take advantage of that. I'd heard the stats about how most traders fail, but it didn't really phase me. I still wanted to try, but I was also like aware of that, so I didn't want to do anything too dumb. So at the time, this is what I was doing. But first, some definitions. Investing, kind of like marriage. So you pledge to have and to hold a good company, good quality company for life or at least until retirement. And day trading is kind of the opposite of that. So it's more like a one night stand. Basically you want whatever's hot in the moment, you're in, you're out the same day and you don't care if you ever see them again. While I was working full time, you know, I wanted to be a day trader, but you know, I didn't, I, I knew I didn't know anything. So I was doing a combination of swing trading, which is trades that last a few days or maybe a few weeks or a few months and investing. And I think this is pretty common, but basically the strategy was trying to time the market on the stocks that I would be investing in anyway. I figured the stocks that I would be investing in anyway, if I wasn't trying to play with the markets, are the, those are things like, you know, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, Apple, Google, Amazon, whatever. I'm a software engineer, forgive me. My one and only rule was that I would never realize a loss. In the great wise words of Warren Buffett, rule one is never lose money. So yeah, I'll try to get the gains and sell out at the top and then wait for a dip and buy back in. But if things happen to crash after I buy them, even if it was like a 2001 like crash, I'm holding to a retirement, no realizing a loss ever. So in terms of risk, there was none other than what I would have been exposed to anyway as a normal investor. But I knew obviously there's opportunity cost because you know, I also knew the statistics, like if you miss the 10 best days of the market over the last decade, then you miss like 80% of the gains or something ridiculous. I don't know. And yeah, so opportunity cost was the only real loss. So in terms of the methodology that I was using, um, I'm not going to pretend that I had anything. So this was entirely based off gut feel. There was nothing scientific about it. I didn't do any historical analysis or backtesting. The most scientific I ever got with it was like, oh, you know, if something's down 10%, then I'll buy it and write it back to all time highs and then sell out at all time highs. But like, there was nothing scientific about it, honestly. The tools I was using, I was using Stake as my trading platform and that was about it. Stake is this really simple app that basically has two buttons like buy and sell and it's pretty much it. Obviously I hoped to beat the market, but I also hoped that by being active in the market, I would learn something about them. And in terms of results, well, like I'm not gonna pretend I measured this. I was not being scientific at the time. And also I wasn't doing it for long. And the saddest part is that I didn't learn anything either. I just wanted to give that context to show where I was at the time. And now let's jump into when I actually quit my job. Basically it was mid 2020, COVID had hit and it had become really clear that my office was like never going back to the actual office and we were gonna be work from home forever. And I'd wanted to do this project for so long and I figured this is gonna be a project where I'm like on my own and isolated for a year. So may as well do it now and I'm gonna be on my own and isolated for a year anyway. <laughs> so I quit my job and I set myself some very hard rules and goals. I had three rules. Firstly is I would time box this to 12 months exactly. I'm not gonna, you know, get to the end of 12 months and be like, oh, you know, being unemployed, kind of nice. Uh, I was gonna go back to work after 12 months. Secondly is if I was ever down 15%, one five, uh, I would stop immediately. And my third rule was to treat it like a business. Hope is not a strategy. And I believe that in like every area of life. I had one and only goal 
and that was to learn as much as possible during this year off. At the end of 12 months, I need to be able to answer the question, to what extent can trading provide a living income? Like, is this a viable career path or not? I also had like, I guess a secondary list of goals, but it's more like a nice to haves. So basically those were a tier in order of, you know, don't develop a gambling problem and don't lose money, make money as in anything more than zero dollars, beat the market, beat Atlassian, and then make a living income. And then, you know, higher than that would probably be like, you know, retire in my beach mansion with my Ferrari or Tesla or whatever. So to be honest about my expectations for the year off, I had no expectations of financial success because I think that would be quite naive, but I did expect that I would achieve one of two things, either A, have financial success, or B, realize that trading is not for me and at least I will have had the urge to trade get out of my system, which honestly would have been a pretty big win because I think otherwise I always would have wanted to try this. All right, let's talk about gateway drugs. So I quit my job and started to write the trading bot, but to be honest, the complexity of a trading bot had scared me for such a long time, which is why I hadn't done it yet. How do you even process like thousands of data points a second per stock about financial transactions on the exchange? Are there thousands or like, is it more than that? And you know, like how do you build a strategy off the top of that, all that data? Surely at that point you would have to pipe it into like a machine learning algorithm and then like surely someone's done that and I'm not an expert in machine learning so I wouldn't have an advantage there. The whole thing just scared me. And that's when I found my gateway drug, which was technical analysis and candlestick charts. If you don't know anything about technical analysis or candlesticks, moving averages, support or resistance, then watch this bit, otherwise feel free to skip ahead. So candlestick charts are one way of displaying trading data and they really showed me how simple the data storage and data processing of trading data could be. You can distill any time period down into these four key data points, which is the price it opened at, the price it closed at, and then the highest and lowest prices it hit during that time period. So this for me, like, kind of blew my mind. Like it's very simple, right? But then it completely solved the transaction firehose problem because I realized that my bot could very easily store data like that. Okay, awesome. So technical analysis, what the heck is that? Uh, it's basically about using past trading data to predict future price movement of a stock. Now, some people call this astrology, but I found it really helpful. On the other side of technical analysis, the opposite is fundamental analysis. And that's analyzing all the things that have to do with the actual business. So things like, I don't know, the balance sheet and the earnings and the total adjustable market and competitor analysis and all this stuff that I don't know about. And that's why, uh, that's why technical analysis was kind of music to my ears. Cause I was like, I don't know anything about the businessy side of things. And I feel like it would take a long time to learn, but I feel like I could pick out a pattern in a, in a chart, you know, like how hard could that be? <laughs> so chart patterns are the first thing I found when reading up on technical analysis. So here's a couple of examples of those. This is a chart of the S&P 500 where each candle represents one day. The purple line on it is the moving average. Basically in this graph, it's the average price of the last seven days. Imagine you bought in every time the S&P 500 crossed the rising moving average line and then you sold every time it dipped back below it. Looks like you'd make a pretty good profit, right? And it looks easy, right? And it's also like so appealing because it totally keeps you out of downturns. And how good is that? Like next stop is buying a Ferrari, you know? This chart is of Splunk. This is a company that I adore both as a software engineer and as a trader. Support and resistance are these imaginary lines you can draw on a chart to show the channel it's been trading in and I guess predict the channel it's gonna keep trading in. Support is the price that always stays above and then resistance is the price that it always seems to get knocked back at. Some traders use support and resistance as entry and exit points because they just wanna trade in that channel and then other traders use breakouts when it breaks above the line of resistance to buy in because they think it's just going to go to the moon at that point. So the reason these chart patterns were my gateway drug is because they seemed just really easy to code up and test and tweak. So I started writing the actual bot. The first step for that was to move away from stake, which was the broker I was using. And I switched to interactive brokers because they had an API that seemed pretty legit. Like it would make, you know, building a trading bot relatively easy. I chose to use Java as my language because to be honest, I didn't know how the bot would develop later. I didn't know what I would need from it. And I wanted to spend my time learning about trading and not learning about new languages. I was already familiar with Java and yeah, I figured eventually once I was done with the MVP, like I would want to switch to Python for the data science libraries or maybe C++ for the speed. But yeah, kept it simple for the MVP and just used a language I was already familiar with. 
I also on that note used SQLite for storing historical data. Kept it pretty simple. The first thing I did was code up some simple strategies. So they were things like breakouts and the moving average one that I showed before. And to be honest about the results of those, like they were basically break even. I was programming them on an intraday scale and yeah, they didn't really show any results. And that unintuitively maybe is the worst kind of result to have, because if you happen to find a losing strategy, you can just flip it around to make it a winning strategy. You know, if, if it was going long, then you go short. But, you know, if it's breaking even, there's really nothing you can do about that. So that was pretty sad, but it wasn't unexpected. And statistically, I think it made sense because, you know, if you take any given stock on any given time of day, then like you buy it and sell a few minutes later, somewhat randomly, then you probably are gonna break even because things don't move all that much. So I was breaking even on those like first page of Google results strategies. And that's when I decided I should probably put some more thought into it. I probably needed to put some more thought and effort into it. That's when I started to think about it a bit more. And this is what I concluded. The strategies that I was trading were all momentum based strategies. And when a momentum based strategy is going to work the best, when there's momentum uh, and when it holds momentum. So instead of, trying to find a new strategy, I decided from that point that I would take those existing strategies and just find the stocks that it would work with. To translate that, what I'm trying to say is I was just going to find the stocks that go straight up. And I realized that's genius, right? And like, why doesn't everyone do that? But I was serious about this. So obviously that's not an easy task because nothing goes straight up, but I went back and forth a lot on trying to find stocks that sort of you know, go straight up for a while. And that was kind of the boring part, but let me cut to the first working strategy that I used in the bot. This was to trade the biggest moving stocks at market open specifically. So I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, stocks tend to move the most after market open for the first half hour of a trading day. So the strategy was firstly, before market open, scan to find the stocks that have moved the most since the previous day. Secondly, filter those down to the ones that are trading with significantly higher volume than normal. Thirdly, filter those ones down to the stocks that had gapped on the chart to an interesting technical point. So for example, support or resistance. And the chart I showed of Splunk before, which I'll put it now again, is a perfect example of that. It had moved heaps from the previous day. It had gapped right to resistance. And in my mind, that means it's either going straight up or straight down. Step four was to just sit back and watch what the stock does for a minute or two after open. And step five is whatever direction it seems to be going in for those first couple minutes, jump on and try and ride that trend. It didn't matter if the stock had gupped up or down overnight, whatever it was doing in the first few minutes of market open, it would continue to do that. The all important step six is to set exit orders. So the bot would set two kinds of exit orders. First is the target price. Obviously that's the price that it wants to hit. That's where you make your money and bail and say, okay, I don't think it's going to run any further. Let's get out now. Second and probably more importantly is the stop loss. So that's, you know, if the trade's going against you, then, you know, at what point do you say, Hey, I was wrong. I'm out. GG. The secret third kind of exit order was, if the stock happened to never hit the target or stop loss prices, then it would sell out at the end of the day. My rule was to never hold overnight because that seemed really risky and like I couldn't control that risk. In terms of the risk of this whole bot strategy, no individual trade could ever lose me that much money, but I was worried about death by a thousand cuts. And the reason I was worried about that is because I had backtested this strategy across months of data. And, you know, because I started trading in mid 2020, and this was about when I was running this backtesting, it meant that I had tested it in both a very bearish market and a very bullish market. So I had some level of confidence that, you know, it would work in either scenario. However, my fundamental statistics knowledge was not actually that great. So I knew that there would have been down days that I should have expected, but I didn't know, I didn't have a great model for how many down days in a row would be okay. Because the thing about bot trading is that you're not meant to lose your confidence. Like if you have a couple down days in a row, you're meant to sit back and say, Hey, like this is part of the plan. Like the only way the casino wins is if they keep, you know, keep trading after a loss and it'll work out in the end. But then on the other hand, it's like, when do you stop and say, okay, market conditions have changed or something's wrong with my strategy inherently. 
this doesn't work anymore, I need to bail. I set a pretty arbitrary answer to that of when I would pull out and it would probably make most statisticians cry. The other pretty big risk, I think, is unknown unknowns. And like, that sounds ridiculous, but here's the thing. I probably shouldn't admit this, but I don't think I've ever written code without a bug. Like, it's pretty atrocious. And now, like, my money was on the line. Also, combine that with the fact that I didn't have any idea of how exchanges actually worked. I didn't have any idea how trades actually got executed. I didn't have any great ideas of what the failure cases were. And therefore, I didn't really know what edge cases to program for. So I thought something's going to go wrong and I have no idea what it is or what to look for. And yeah, now my money was on the line. So that was a bit of a risk as well. So what were the results of this strategy? Um, I'm going to just say it wasn't too shabby. I still use this strategy today, but I have made tweaks and improvements along the way in terms of really specific results. I have no desire to provide them, but if you really want them, you can buy me a drink. Phase two of my year off was all about improving what the bot could do. This was all about growing the number of strategies the bot could use, as well as tweaking and refining them by taking more information into account. Building off the first pattern was actually pretty easy. So basically I would take all the historical data and the actual trades the bot made, and I would look for patterns among the winners and patterns among the losers. And what I found pretty quickly is that there were some repeat offending stocks in the losers. Then I changed my bot strategy a little bit to say, Hey, before you start going long or shorting this particular stock, check to see if it's failed this strategy in the past. And if it has stay out of this trade, but then you quickly realize like, wait, why would you stay out of a bad trade when you could just take the other side of it? That gave me the inspiration to build in a reversal seeking pattern into the bot. So everything I had done so far was about momentum. And yeah, this was the first particular bot strategy I had that actually looked for a peak and then a decline. So basically this new reversal strategy, it would take the same stocks from the first strategy, but it would look for companies that had failed that particular strategy before. Then it would attempt to find a local minima or maxima based on that particular stock's past trading data and a couple of heuristics as well. Then the bot would take the opposite side of that trade and hope that went well. I ended up implementing more strategies like that in a very similar way. So basically one of my favorite things became looking for when an expected pattern fails and then taking the other side of that expected pattern. One example of that is trading failed breakouts. A breakout, what I showed before, sometimes, you know, they come right back down and they fail. I found that looking at failed patterns is often a good entry signal to the other side. In the Java code I wrote that powered the bot, I had two interfaces initially. Those were entry signal and exit signal. But after I combined all the combinations of those and backtested those with each other, I realized that an entry signal is an exit signal for the other side. Although it's worth noting that not all exit signals are entry signals. Sometimes an exit signal just means the stock has tapered off and it's not going to do anything interesting for a while again. Another improvement I made was well, for context, I knew almost nothing about stocks when I started. And so I've learned a lot along the way. My bot started looking at three particular metrics and those were price, volume, and time of day. And the reason my bot was looking at those metrics is because those are the only ones I really knew about. I pretty gradually started adding in more data points, the more I learned about them. So that included things like stock market cap and float, but it also included more than that as well. One thing I noticed pretty early on is that all stocks seem to move together. And that was the end of my bot looking at any stock in isolation. Basically now my bot always takes into account what is the S and P 500 doing at the time? And how is this stock relevant to that? It also looks at the VIX as well, which is not something that I realized existed before I started this trading journey. Also over time, time became more important. My bot originally started looking at the time of day because I knew that market open trades differently to pre-market, which trades differently to lunch and close and after hours. I don't know why, but they do. Then time became more important because I realized that the day of the week matters, the week of the month matters and the month of the year matters, but more on that later. The next phase of my whole year off is what I would call the bionic trading phase, where this was all about a part human, part bot partnership instead of the bot working alone or instead of me trading alone. The overall idea was basically this. So the bot is really excellent at some things. It's really excellent at taking thousands of stocks and distilling them down into 20 interesting ones. And it's also at excellent at being totally emotion free. So 
it's really good at sticking to a plan. It never gets greedy and it never gets fearful. And that's more than I can say for myself. However, the bot was doing an okay job at picking what strategy to use on what stock at what time. I had a hypothesis that I could outperform the bot in choosing the strategy, and then the bot could outperform me on actually executing the strategy. The strategy I would choose would be entirely based off what catalyst the stock had to be moving that day. I had learned more about some more data points and I noticed some of those were not easily programmable into the bot. So that's why this phase got kicked off. One of these unautomatable data points was short data. So that's things like the short interest, the available shares to short, uh, the short fee rates, and whether the stock is in short sale, restricted mode, or not. Um, and I'm not gonna explain what those are because I think the whole GameStop saga made them quite popular. But suffice to say, one of my early strategies was when there are no more shares left to short of a particular company, then the bot should go long at that point. The frustrating part about this is that it really could be automatable, it's just numbers, but the API I'm using doesn't expose that data. So maybe there's a way I could do it, but I haven't figured it out just yet. Another example of an unautomatable data point is actually a company's fundamental analysis. So my bot can't differentiate two companies from each other, and I don't know anything about fundamental analysis, but I can differentiate a meme scam stock from a stable company. And that's worth something. I noticed, especially when trading momentum at market open, the ones that often fail that trade are often like the meme hype stocks. And yeah, I'm pretty good at telling which one those are and my bot isn't. So these stocks are really questionable companies and they tend to follow what I call the mountain biker pattern, which yes, I made up, but let's run with it. So what I mean by that is someone took them to the top of a hill and now they're definitely on a downslope over the long term, but they have heaps of little fun ramps along the way. So by meme stocks, I mean things that pump and dump, things that get hot on Reddit, uh, occasionally things like marijuana stocks where, you know, someone will hype it up by being like, oh, you know, a senator mentioned this yesterday, therefore it's going to be legal tomorrow. Although I can't use it super often because it certainly doesn't happen every day, I really enjoy trading this pattern. So basically this is a combination of me and my bot, which I'll explain later, but Basically, the overall strategy is whenever a really high volume day hits for one of these stocks and the price is soaring up, you basically take the previous high volume day, uh, look for the volume weighted average price of that day, and that's the price where you should short it today. Uh, the reason this requires a human bot partnership is because I have literally given the bot a hard coded list of companies that I think will follow this pattern that I think have started this pattern, and also I remove companies from that list when I think they're too low to bother with anymore. For example, Nicola is one of those. Maybe one day we'll meet again. Identifying these companies is probably something that's automatable, but again, I'm not there yet, and I trust my decision making more than I trust my ability to automate this. So thirdly, and this is absolutely my favorite way to have a human bot partnership, is news analysis. So sometimes news comes out about a company and the stock starts shooting to the moon and doesn't stop. And sometimes news comes out about a company and it starts shooting to the moon and then drops like a crater even further than it was when it started. The decision to make a momentum based trade or a reversal based trade in that situation is pretty important. I found that reversals like that are really often the result of fake news. And to be honest, I think I'm a really good picker of fake news. Um, for me, fake news comes in two broad categories, which is firstly, bad news about a good company and good news about a really bad company, which often the company has paid for. I really hate what journalists do, to be honest, but especially with like, you know, free journalism with the clickbait and the over-exaggeration and the panic. Uh, but unfortunately it's always going to exist, which gives me security that this strategy will always be viable. So my thesis here was that by keeping tabs on the news and by keeping track of which companies are legit and which companies aren't, I can make the bot do better than it can on its own. And so far that thesis holds. Uh, the only problem is that, you know, something that attracted me to a trading bot in the first place was the idea that it's passive income because the bot can do its thing while I'm asleep. But these strategies, yeah, they, they involve my effort. And it is worth it, I think, because A, the results, kind of make it worth it, but also like, I think it's pretty fun. 
So one of the final reasons that I like the human bot partnership is because of empathy stocks. So I mentioned before that my, my bot will never look at a stock in isolation. It will always track the S&P 500, but that's not entirely true because sometimes depending on what stock it's trading, the S&P 500 isn't the right leader to follow. So one pretty clear example of this is when the GameStop saga happened, it was really, um, easy, I guess, to trade Nokia and Blackberry and AMC based off of the movements that GameStop was doing, not off the movements that the S&P 500 were doing. So I'm pretty good, I suppose, at picking the leader that a stock should follow or at least watch out for, for red flags. And my bot isn't, it would have no idea how to do that. So the next phase is options. And I know some people who are waiting for this and this is gonna disappoint you all, but Anyway, somewhere along the way, I found the options market and it blew my mind. This could be a whole nother video, but I will try and keep it brief. Basically, I'd seen the same statistic repeated everywhere that 80% of options expire worthless and retail options traders are dumb as bricks. But here's the thing, options data is public information. Like you can literally see where 80% of options are supposedly going to expire worthless. So why not be on the other side of that trade? Um, now, something I want to clarify is that I never actually traded options in my year off, but I used the data that the options market showed to better inform my bot of how to trade the underlying stocks. So I used to have support and resistance levels, for example, in the bot based off of the past trading data. But now, depending on what day of the week it was, I would use the options levels instead. And it worked so much better. So this also improved my timing abilities pretty drastically. So options expire every Friday of the week for a lot of stocks that I trade. And this actually ended up changing my stock trading habits for every other day of the week. Basically the way it works is that on Wednesdays, we start paying attention to what options levels seem like they have the most interest. And if the stock is trading like reasonably high above where 80% of the options interest is, it's probably a good time to short it. So I enter small positions then. So for instance, if there's a ton of options at the $20 level for a stock, but the stock itself is trading at $22, then there's a gap there. And one of these trades is gonna be wrong. So I figure better to follow the options and see what they say. On Thursdays and Fridays, I do the same thing, but I go in a lot harder, especially if there's more divergence. It's seems like much more of a sure thing at that point. And nothing is ever a sure thing. So I still have stop losses and everything set up, but this gives me more conviction to go in on a trade. Mondays are easily my favorite days because yet again, I really like trading expected patterns that fail. And the expected pattern is that 80% of options expire worthless, right? So on Mondays, if 80% of options didn't expire worthless the week before, particularly if they expired just in the money. So let's say there's a whole bunch of options at the $20 level and then the stock finishes at like $20.06. Monday is a perfect day to go full short. I don't know why, but seems to work a lot of the time. So I'm at the point now where the bot really only trades its original strategies on Tuesdays without any influence from the options market. And there's more to it than that, but that's a topic for a whole nother day. So that was my 12 months off. I hit 12 months and sadly I wasn't yet chilling on the beach with my mansion and my Lamborghini. So I went back to work, got another full-time job again as a software engineer. Trading while working full-time is like a completely different ball game because a lot of the strategies like the part human bot, part bot strategies are way harder working full-time, especially when, you know, I'm in Australia and the markets are in America and the time zones are just rubbish. So now I'm focusing more on swing trades than day trades because I don't have the capacity for day trades anymore, but I have been able to take a lot of my learnings from day trading and apply them to swing trading. I have been trading options a little bit here and there. Um, basically I'm always selling covered calls against any of my long positions and I occasionally have turned some long positions into leaps. So those who are familiar with options, I'm using leaps at the 0.9 Delta at the very furthest expiration date possible. For those who don't understand options, don't worry about it. I'll explain it another time. The covered calls that I'm selling are at that 80% interest level. I have never back tested why, like whether 80% means anything. It's just in my little anecdotal experience so far, it seems to be a relatively good indicator. So if my covered calls ever get exercised, I'm more than happy to sell out my stock because that's my short signal anyway. And then if I want to buy back in, I'll generally wait till the next Tuesday to do that because 
that's after the big short day and then hopefully it's also a less volatile day in terms of options premiums and things like that. But as always, it depends on a lot of variables and what the stock is doing generally and to be honest, probably my mood as well, which is not ideal, but you know, I'm getting there. If all that made no sense, I'm sorry. If it did make sense to you, then please roast me and give me better ideas. What is next for me to explore? So I wanted to have a section on this because I feel like this is an important part of my journey too. And I'd really like to document my whole journey. So for me, I'm going to start with what's not next. I have so much left to explore and experiment with, but yeah, I figure clarifying what I'm not doing next might be helpful. So firstly, and I guess I'll limit this to the next 12 months, but this is what I'm not doing next in the next 12 months. I will not be trading crypto. Now, there's a few key reasons for this and probably none of them are the reason you're thinking of in your head right now. But often when I tell people I'm a trader, they're like, "Ooh, crypto, how do you trade crypto? Let me, let me get all the guts. And I'm sorry to say that I won't be satisfying those urges anytime soon. Secondly is machine learning. Now, I think it'd be really cool to experiment with machine learning and to see if I can get any useful results out of it. But I also have so much other things to do and I'm just really not confident that it would do anything for me. As much as I'd like to experiment with it, like I feel like smarter people have been there and done that. Thirdly is trading on the ASX. Now, obviously I'm Australian and a lot of my Aussie friends are asking me about which ASX stocks to pick and I have no idea. Um, you know, as tempting as it would be to trade in my own time zone, um, the US is my home ground for now and that's not gonna change in the next year. Fourthly, IPOs. So I've never traded an IPO and I'm not gonna start now. Um, I have no idea how to, and I'm not gonna pretend I know how to, even though they seem like really good opportunities to get in on something volatile. And lastly is automating sentiment or news analysis. I will not be doing that. So maybe that's an ego thing because I quite enjoy being good at picking fake news, but I just don't think I can translate that logic very easily into code. I totally acknowledge I might be shooting myself in the foot by not looking into these things because maybe they're super useful, but I believe that focus is important and sticking to a niche is important. And there's more to explore in the current niche that I have found. I also want to be realistic about how much I can actually do right now with a full-time job and other hobbies and social life and so on. There is a comic I love about this. I'll put it on the screen. It's basically this caveman dragging along a cart with no wheels and someone's offering him wheels and he says, nope, don't got time for that. It's possible that's what I'm doing, but I'm gonna take my chances. We'll never know. What I actually want to do next in the next 12 months is firstly is to understand options so much better. This is before automating anything. I just want to understand and maybe build up models for when the Greeks are important and what I should be thinking about with regards to options, because currently it's literally just where the 80% of options lie. And that's it. Um, I can define the Greeks for you, but you know, I can't actually say when I'd use them. Secondly is crypto, but not trading crypto. I just want to learn about the space um, and draw my own conclusions about where I see it going as a technology in the future. Thirdly, I would like to start automating some of the strategies that I haven't automated yet and see what I can do around the automation of options as well. And lastly is I want to make some human trading connections. This has been a really lonely journey so far. And like I said, all my friends think I'm like, you know, participating in pump and dumps or whatever. Um, so it'd be nice to find some people who actually like enjoy sparring or, you know, like throwing ideas around because I love having that in software development and I just haven't had it in trading yet. So yeah, working on that. And as a bonus point on this list, I would also really like to learn more about fundamental analysis to me. Fundamental analysis seems a little bit like astrology. And I know people say that about technical analysis, but yeah, I just, I do not understand it. And I would like to learn everything I can learn about it. It isn't my biggest priority, but I know that whatever I learn about it will be helpful in some ways. And that's it. So if you made it this far, thank you. And I hope it was helpful in some way, even if that way is deciding that traders are actually crazy. One thing I know for sure after a year off is that no matter what stage of life I'm in, I will never be a regular investor again. Like I am completely hooked on this stuff. I love it. And I'd like to keep sharing my journey. So if you're keen to follow along, feel free to follow along. If so, if you have any thoughts or advice or want to roast my journey so far, please do. I'm always keen to hear that. Otherwise, until next time, thank you for stopping by. And I hope this gave a realistic insight into what trading is actually like.